been doing a series, a study through the book of Job. We're in chapter 4, if you want to find Job chapter 4. The book of Job, probably more than any other book in the Bible, leads the reader, leads the, the worshiper to ask the question, why? On every page of this narrative, you're left wondering, why? The primary question we all have when we read the story in the book of Job can be summed up in the age-old question that you've probably asked yourself at some point along your journey in life. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why? How many of you have ever asked a question like that? Why do Uh, bad things happen to good people. Anybody else or just me? Raise your hand. You ain't got to be ashamed. That's what I thought. Pretty much all of us. It's an important question. It's a hard question. It's a question that we've all asked. And dare I say that the person you have asked that question about or of was probably not near as righteous as Job. Just as a reminder of who Job was, Uh, I want you to remember how God described him back in Job chapter 1, verse 8. In Job 1, 8, it says this, Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? No one else on earth is like him, a man of perfect integrity who fears God and turns away from evil. Now, this, this, these aren't Job's friends describing Job. This isn't Job describing Job. This isn't Job's Sunday school teacher describing Job. This is God describing Job, the creator of the universe. And as God looks out across the span of eternity, he looks at the life of this man And he describes him as being a man of perfect integrity, a man who fears God and a man who shuns and turns away from evil. And yet this man, this good man, described like that by the creator of the universe, this man who stands out above all other men on earth at the time, lost everything. In a single day. He lost all of his material wealth. He lost all of his livestock. He lost all ten of his grown children. Almost all of his servants were killed on the exact same day as well. He basically loses everything in one day. And then shortly after that, he lost his health. He found himself ultimately in the midst of this mess, in the midst of this chaos, he finds himself sitting in the ashes, scraping the boils on his skin with broken pottery. You can't read the first two chapters of this book and not ask the question, why? Last time we were together, we looked at Job chapter 3, where Job comes out of his time of silence, his time in the ashes, and for the first time, Job speaks and at some length as to what's going on. And you can tell in Job chapter 3 that Job is hurt, Job is frustrated, Job is confused, Job is suffering, but he never blames God, and he never curses God. Today, we're going to look at chapter 4, and really, we could be looking at chapter 4 and five, because all the points we're going to make today can be seen in chapter five as well. But we're going to primarily stay in chapter four for the sake of time. And here in chapter four and five, one of Job's three friends, his friend Eliphaz, speaks up. This is the first major discourse from Eliphaz that we get to read about. We don't know much about Eliphaz, but what we do know is important. The name Eliphaz means God is victorious. And it seems clear from his interactions with Job, it seems clear from the way that he speaks and and his heart that we can see in the, the book if we look for it, it seems clear that on some level Eliphaz is attempting to walk in his own personal life with God. He has a relationship with the Lord. He comes to Job and attempts to speak even on behalf of God. 
He's someone who's following the Lord at some level. Now, he falls short. He doesn't get it perfect. He's not a man we would want to model our lives after. But he's in the midst of a difficult situation, and he's trying to help a friend who's in even a more difficult situation. Eliphaz is also, it's a f- worth noting, he's, he's the one who always speaks first of the three friends. So most scholars believe that means that Eliphaz is probably the oldest of Job's three friends and presumably the wisest, though most of his wisdom isn't very wise. From chapter 4 to chapter 27, these three friends all come to Job and they offer in various ways their thoughts on the question why. Why this is all happening to Job, why he's suffering in the way that he's suffering, why he's facing the adversity he's facing. And today I want to deal with the main theological principle that applies to all three of Job's friends. All three of Job's friends come back to this one central theological argument or theological principle to answer the question why, why this is happening to Job. It's known in our time today as the retribution principle or retribution theology. This kind of theology is the theology that says God brings retribution on those who deserve it and he he brings blessing on those who deserve it or earn it. We hear this kind of theology all the time. In fact, if you think about the conversations that you have throughout your week or even the conversations you have in your own mind, you'll probably see signs and symptoms of this theology in your own life. I'm going to give you some big examples, some examples that are real clear and easy for us to see how this plays out. But really and truly, this this happens in our schools, in our workplaces, in our homes. It happens everywhere. But retribution theology is the kind of theology you hear, for example, when 9-11 happened. How many of you were around and remember 9-11? Okay, it's been a while, but most of us. When 9-11 happened, you heard a lot of people say, God is punishing America because they have abandoned the Bible. Or God is punishing America because they have abandoned the church. Or God is punishing America because they have turned their backs on him. That's retribution theology. Or you'll hear it, for example, sometimes people will say, well, God sent that hurricane to devastate that city because of the wickedness that's there. Or he died or she died so young because God was punishing them for their sins. Or that earthquake or that famine hit that country or that city or that region or area of the world, and that's a sign of God's judgment. That's retribution theology in big, obvious ways, but again, it plays out in smaller ways in all of our lives. And the difficulty is this, we we definitely know that God in his sovereignty, the Lord, he does at times discipline and even destroy those who turn away from him and those who live in rebellion to his kingdom agenda. But compared to his grace and his patience and his long sufferingness and his forgiveness of sinners, there's really no denying the fact that it's very rare to see the Lord respond with what we might call retribution or retribution theology. But this is the main take from all three of Job's friends. All three of Job's friends prescribe this theology to Job's situation, that Job is suffering and being punished because of the sins he's committed in his life. One commentator said it like this. He said, all of Job's friends agree that the retribution principle is true and that it is applicable to Job. In fact, they go so far as to conclude that those who prosper are pious, and those who suffer are necessarily sinners. However, they are ignorant of what the reader knows from the prologue, that in Job's case, there are other factors involved. He's right. We have more context than Job's three friends did. We know that Job was a good man. We can read the words, how God described Job himself. We we know that God's not punishing him for any kind of sin, but they don't know that. We, we know that because we have the context. And here's my caution for you, and here's the reason for the whole sermon. We know that about Job, 
But we may not and probably don't know that about the person that sits across from us at work. We don't know that about the city or the country. We don't know that about the family that goes through great adversity or hardship or suffering in their life. We know this about Job, but we don't know that about them. We don't have the full context and the full eternal picture when a natural disaster or war or financial crisis or some other negative event strikes somewhere. Most of the time, we just don't know. And the problem is, most of the time, when people turn to this idea of retribution theology, it's because they need an answer for the question, why? Why did that happen? And they don't feel like they necessarily need the right answer They just feel like they need an answer. And that's the easiest answer to find. Today, our big idea is this. When it comes to the great question, why, or the great why questions of life, having the correct answer or the right answer is more important than having an answer. Having the right answer is more important than having an answer. If you don't have the right answer, it would be better for you not to give an answer at all. So I want us to look very quickly here at how we can avoid making the three big mistakes all three of Job's friends make that led them to the wrong answer. And then we're going to conclude by giving a little taste of what we're going to talk about next week and how we can have a faithful perspective as God's followers and make sure that when the questions of why come up, we give the correct answers. So first, if we're going to avoid the mistakes they make, Um, we have to see that that Eliphaz has a flawed theology. He has a flawed theology. That's point number one. Eliphaz lays out his theological understanding of Job's suffering in places like verse 5 of chapter 4. And while he's trying to help his friend make sense of all this stuff, his theology here at church is just flawed. Listen to it. Job 4, verse 5, But now that this has happened to you, You have become exhausted. It strikes you and you are dismayed. Isn't your piety, your confidence, and the integrity of your life, your hope? Consider who has perished. When when he was innocent, where have the honest been destroyed? In verse 7, he basically says, you're getting what you deserve. Innocent people, he says, are not punished. Innocent people don't perish. Honest and righteous People are not destroyed. When have you seen that? He he basically says, God's giving you what you deserve, Job. You must have done something wrong. You must have offended God. You must have sinned against God. One commentator summed it up like this, saying, For the first of many times, the standard argument of the friends appears. There are certain rules by which the universe operates, they've concluded, These rules dictate that good comes to those who are righteous and bad comes to those who are wicked. Working backward from effect to cause, it means that if people suffer, it is because they have sinned. And if they are blessed, it is because they have trusted and obeyed. Eliphaz seems to know of no innocent person who ever suffered. And he apparently had never witnessed the upright destroyed. He had no place in his theology to put Job except among the guilty and the godless. Despite all he knew of Job's piety and good works, Eliphaz could not account for Job's suffering except to view it as punishment for sin. You see, this kind of theological position, it's easy to fall into because it offers a quick and easy answer to a very difficult question. Why? But it's actually lazy theology is all it is. And most of the time, in my estimation, it misses the mark. There's a general principle in life, and this principle is found in Scripture as well. The principle can be summed up by saying this, you reap what you sow. How many of you have ever heard that? Amen? You reap what you sow. It's all through Scripture. It doesn't just have to do with money. It doesn't just have to do with agriculture. It's, It's a general principle we see over and over and over again in Scripture. 
One example of that is Proverbs 22, 8 and 9. The one who sows injustice will reap disaster, and the rod of his fury will be destroyed. A generous person, on the other hand, will be blessed, for he shares his food with the poor. You reap what you sow. That's a general principle. And as a general principle, it is true. But that doesn't mean that someone who is good and righteous and someone who is seeking God will never be treated unjustly. It doesn't mean somebody who's good and righteous and a person of character and integrity will never have disaster or hardship or suffering come into their life. And it doesn't mean that a generous person will always be blessed. In the same way, it doesn't mean that a person who's a sinner or is bad and isn't following God will never have a blessing in their life. It's a good general rule, but it can't be applied to every situation. Just like we know that in general, I think we can agree on this, we know that in general, if you smoke, you're more likely to develop cancer and die at an earlier age than those who don't, right? If you smoke a pack a day, in general, you're going to die younger than if you don't. But several years ago, I buried a man who was 94, and he had smoked at least a pack a day since World War II. That's when he picked it up. He had smoked a pack a day or more since World War II, and he died in his sleep because he was 94. He didn't have a problem in the world other than he was 94. Had nothing to do with him smoking. Now, none of us would say that single specific example would be a reason to go out and start smoking a pack a day, right? If somebody said, well, hey, I'm going to use that example as my reason to go out and start smoking a pack a day today, they would be crazy. That one example doesn't negate the general rule. It doesn't mean that the general rule no longer applies. It just means that outside of the general rule, there will be outliers. And we find that across life. Eliphaz is unable to answer the question why, in part because he has this flawed theology. So how can we avoid that flawed theology in our own lives? I think there are three specific things, the next three blanks in your outline. The first one is this. We have to avoid a narrow understanding of God and a narrow understanding of God's word. Like so many of us, Eliphaz, he had convinced himself that there was only one possible reason why all of this could be happening to Job. He had a very narrow mindset. He had a very narrow understanding of how God works. He had a very, very narrow understanding. And that narrow understanding lacked the context that's needed to explain these big questions of why. I'm not blaming him for this. I'm not judging him for this. In fact, we can all fall into this narrow mindset at times in our lives. And when we do, and when I do, and when you do, When we do this, we become endangered of bringing a a very flawed theology, a false theology, into the lives of other people. We have to remember that, that we only get to see in part. We only see part of the picture. We don't always have all the information. We don't always have all of the context. The Apostle Paul in the book of Corinthians, he he told the Corinthian church. In chapter 13, starting around verse 12, he says, Now we only see a dim reflection. We only see in part. We only know in part. We only comprehend in part. And then he says that only there and then, when we get to eternity, when we get to the other side, shall we know fully as we are fully known. In his second letter to the Corinthians, in chapter 4, starting around verse 16, he tells them uh, about what is seen and what is unseen. He's talking about the fact that not everything can be seen. He talks about what is temporary and what is eternal. And then he, he concludes that we don't know it all because we don't see it all. So we have to be careful that we don't apply a narrow understanding and a narrow mindset that drives us into a faulty theology. Number two, we have to avoid naive assumptions. 
We're going to deal with this more in point number two, but so I'm, I'm going to keep my comments here really short, but naive assumptions will get us in trouble. The reality is when we start to assume, we are sure to find ourselves very shortly on very shaky ground that will lead us to faulty theology. Our theology, church, must never be based on our assumptions. It must always be based firmly and be rooted firmly and stand solely on the solid foundation which is the holy word of God. Finally, the third thing we have to watch out for is we can't neglect prayer. Before you start making theological arguments with your friends, with your family, before you start putting theological things out on social media, before you come in and sit down with a pastor in his study and make your theological discourse, you better spend some time with the Spirit of God in prayer. Too many people today speak for God without ever speaking to God. Let me say that again. Too many people today speak for God without ever speaking to God. Before you stand up to speak, you better kneel down and pray. Before you open your mouth, you better open your heart and allow God's Spirit to pour Himself and His Word into it. Before you boldly proclaim, this is what God is doing, this is what God is saying, you better have that confirmation from God. If you don't, all you're likely sharing with your friend or your family or your coworker or your social media feed is a flawed theology, like Eliphaz did. So I'll remind you again, having the correct answer is much more important than having an answer. It would be better to not give an answer at all if you don't have the correct answer. This wasn't Eliphaz's only problem, though. He had a second problem. It's what I call a faulty opinion. I mentioned a moment ago that we have naive assumptions. Those naive assumptions lead us to a flawed theology, but they usually do so via the way of our faulty opinions. Many times those naive assumptions grow up into faulty opinions. And can I just get a witness and an amen in the house? We live in a world where everybody has an opinion about everything. <laughs> and a world where everybody's opinion is not only supposed to matter, but it's supposed to be taken as fact. We have so many experts in the world about everything. You know, it's been in the news here lately, the hurricane, right? I've seen people on social media who are not meteorologists, have never been to school for meteorology or anything, in their basements or their living rooms or their backyards, reporting like a news reporter, telling the world what's going to happen and how this thing is going to strengthen and how it's going to build and where it's going to land and acting as if they have some kind of authority in which to do this. It's crazy. But this is the world in which we live. And that can be applied to so many different things in our world. We live in a world where people expect their opinions to be accepted and never challenged because they're not just opinions, they're facts. But can I just tell you, so many opinions are faulty. I'm not saying you can't have an opinion. I'm not saying you shouldn't have an opinion. I'm not saying don't use your opinion to speak for God if God calls you to do that. But I'm just saying you better make sure it's God's opinion, not just yours. And I don't know, last time I checked, God wasn't asking you for your opinion, and he's never asked me for mine either. God gave us his word, so... He wouldn't have to count on our opinions. I want you to watch what Job's friend does here in verse 8. Look at these first three words. In my experience, those who plow injustice and those who sow trouble reap the same. 
This retribution theology this comes from this faulty opinion based on his naive assumptions, which is also based on his experience. Has anybody ever said that to you? In my experience. He attempts to answer this big question of why all this bad stuff is happening to this good man, Job, based on his experience. Now, experience is a good thing, church, but experience is not a perfect thing. I've experienced a lot of things in my life. I've been blessed to experience a lot of things in my life, but you know what? I haven't experienced everything in life. I've forgotten a lot of what I experienced. Therefore, though my experience is vast, my experience is not complete. And though my experience is vast, my experience is not sufficient in and of itself. See, Eliphaz, he formed this opinion out of his experience. And apparently, he had never, in all of his experience, he had never seen a just person suffer. He had never seen a righteous person face adversity. Apparently, in all of his experience in life, he had never seen an ungodly person experience some kind of favor or blessing. He had never seen an unrighteous person experience or reap some kind of blessing in their life. In his experience, that had never happened. The problem is, well, let me say first, the problem is not that he had an opinion. The problem is that his opinion was based on his experience, and his experience wasn't complete. Thus, it was wrong. And based on his theological argument for why bad things happen to good people like Job, he develops this faulty opinion which he shares with Job. So I come back to the big idea, having the correct answer is more important than having an answer. He didn't have the correct answer, he should have kept his mouth shut. It leads us to point number three, the third thing we have to be cautious about and watch for in our own lives. Again, I'm not trying to beat Eliphaz up because this happens to all of us. None of us, none of us are exempt from this, right? But we see in him this flawed theology and this faulty opinion, and it leads directly to a false conclusion. And that false conclusion is expressed by all three of Job's friends, not just Eliphaz. We see it over and over and over and over again in the next 20 plus chapters of Job. But it can be summed up by just looking at verse 9 here in chapter 4. This is what Eliphaz and the other two friends, to be fair, concluded. This is the theology of retribution in three verses. Look, start in verse 7, Job chapter 4. Consider who has perished when he was innocent. Where have the honest been destroyed? In my experience, those who plow injustice and those who sow trouble reap the same. They perish at the single blast from God and come to an end by the breath of his nostrils. The answer, according to all three of the friends, but Eliphaz here in the text, is that Job is suffering because he has offended God. He has surely sown trouble and sin into his life, and now he's reaping that harvest. His guilt has finally caught up to him, and now he's got to pay the price for whatever sin he's committed. And it must have been bad because, boy, God brought the hammer to him. But it's not true at all. It's totally false. It's a false conclusion. Now, we have the context to know that, but they don't. We, we have the context to see it, but they don't. Therefore, I'm not judging these friends. I'm, I'm speaking this as a word of caution to myself, a word of caution to you, a word of caution to us as a church. Because as we walk in this world, and as we, I believe, long to be faithful to God, amen? You want to be faithful to God? You want to speak life and hope into people? You want to be there to help people when they're dealing with these huge, critical questions of why? You want to be a faithful friend to those who are suffering and those who, who need some encouragement in the Lord? Like, I believe that's who we are as a church. I'm not speaking these words in judgment of Eliphaz at all. I'm speaking them as a word of caution to us that we must be careful and not fall into these same traps. 
of a flawed theology, faulty opinions, and then spreading false conclusions. Praise God that Job is able to withstand all of this nonsense. But the reality is he shouldn't have had to. As faithful disciples of Jesus, we need to make sure that we really and truly do understand that having the right answer, the correct answer, is much more important than having an answer. And my prayer is that you and I and we as a church and our witness for Jesus and our witness of the gospel and our hope in the glory of God, my prayer is that, that, that our response to these why questions will not be based on these three things we've just talked about, but on this last one that we're going to close with and that we're going to pick up on next week. Because this last one is called the faithful perspective. When we face a a why question like Job is facing here, we have to have a faithful perspective. And next week, we're going to talk about eight ways we can make sure that our perspective is always faithful. We're going to see eight specific things that a faithful perspective is always centered on. We just don't have time for it today, and I didn't want to try to rush through it. It's too important, so we're going to do it next week. But I want to close today by by giving you a glimpse into what the faithful perspective looks like and what it's centered on, which is the Word of God and the experience that the Word of God brings to our lives. Why do bad things happen to good people like Job? Well, it's not for the reasons that Eliphaz and his friends thought. The reason is, is because we live in a sinful and a fallen world. We live in a broken place. People aren't always getting what they deserve when something bad happens to them. People aren't always getting what they deserve when something good happens to them. It's just part of the world in which we live. A faithful perspective is centered on the word of God, and we know from God's word that there are many, many, many faithful people in God's word, who face adversity. Amen? Let me give you just a few examples. We'll start with Joseph. Y'all remember Joseph from the Old Testament? Now, I'm sure he wasn't a perfect kid. And yeah, he, he was a bit prideful when he went to his brothers and his mom and dad told him about his dream and said, hey, 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 one day y'all gonna all bow down to me. That probably could have been approached a little different. He probably could have had a little more tact with that. But he did it. And even though he did it the way he did it, I don't think that gave them a reason to desire to kill him, to throw him into a well, to sell him into slavery, which eventually led him to being in prison. I mean, the suffering and the hardship in Joseph's life is incredible. His story is filled with great suffering and with great adversity. But Joseph didn't ever see that as God's retribution on his life. Joseph didn't see that as retribution theology or that he was being punished. He had a faithful perspective. In Genesis chapter 50, starting in verse 19, we see him express it to the same brothers that threw him into the well and sold him into slavery. It says, but Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. I'm in the place of God. You planned evil against me. God planned it for good to bring about the present result, the survival of many people. Therefore, don't be afraid. I will take care of you and your children. And he comforted them and he spoke kindly to them. That's a faithful perspective. Everything that happened to me was for the glory of God and the good of everybody here. The writer of Ecclesiastes was King Solomon, the wisest man to ever walk on the earth. He saw it. He explained it this way several times in the book of Ecclesiastes, but for the sake of time, just look at chapter 8, verses 12 through 14. He says, although a sinner does evil a hundred times and prolongs his life, I also know that it will go well with God-fearing people, for they are reverent before him. However, it will not go well with the wicked, and they will not lengthen their days like a shadow, for they are not reverent before God. That's back to that general principle. You reap what you sow, right? But look at verse 14. There is a futility that is done on the earth, 
There are righteous people who get what the actions of the wicked deserve, and there are wicked people who get what the actions of the righteous deserve. I say that too is futile. He saw it. He saw the brokenness of the world in which he lived. He, he didn't necessarily have an exact answer for it, but he had a faithful perspective of it. Sometimes, he says, good things happen to bad people, and sometimes bad things happen to good people. He couldn't really answer it, but he had a perspective of it that was faithful. Jesus addresses this with his disciples on multiple occasions. Again, for the sake of time, we'll just use one. But the disciples, like so many in their day, had this idea of retribution theology ingrained in them from the time they were kids. If something bad happened to you, it's because you, you've done something bad. God was punishing you. And Jesus, he confronts this head on time and time and time and time again in the gospel. Jesus refutes it over and over and over again. One of the most blatant and easiest places to see is in John chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. It says, as he was passing by, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. A man, a boy, who had been born blind, been blind his whole life. And his disciples, they asked him the question, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents? Whose sin made him blind? Because we know that's how God works. And Jesus blows their minds. I mean, he had to mess their whole little world up on this day. (laughs) His answer, neither. Neither this man or his parents sinned. Jesus says this came about so God's works might be displayed in him. This is for the glory of God. Of God. That is the faithful perspective. It's not that the man sinned. It's not that his parents sinned. This is for the glory of God. Just like in the case of Job, it's about God's glory. Not the individual, not the circumstance, not the situation. It's about the glory of God. Can we agree that the Apostle Paul was faithful to God? Can we agree? That when he gave his life to Christ, he devoted everything he had to serving God and following God and promoting God and promoting the gospel and the kingdom of God. Can we agree? Can I get an amen? Okay. So why did he suffer in such terrible ways? We find testimony about his adversity in places like 2 Corinthians 11, 24 through 28. This is a faithful man of God. Five times I received the 40 lashes, minus one from the Jews. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I received a stoning. Three times I was shipwrecked. I've spent a night and a day in the open sea. On frequent journeys, I've faced dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea, dangers among false brothers, toil and hardship. Many sleepless nights, hunger, thirst, often without food, cold and without clothing, not to mention the other things. There is the daily pressure on me, my concern for all the churches. Would we dare apply the theology of retribution to the life of the Apostle Paul? That all of this happened to him and so much more because of his sin? That all this bad stuff happened to this good man because he was really bad on the inside? No. The faithful perspective, the perspective that Paul presents throughout his letters, is that it was all for the glory of God. If you're still not convinced, consider Jesus himself. Jesus himself faced adversity. Jesus himself suffered. Jesus himself had a lot of pain and agony that you and I can't even imagine and could never have endured. Yet he never sinned a single time. There was literally no sin at all in Jesus. 1 Peter 2.21 says it like this, For you were called to this, because Christ also suffered for you leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Verse 22, he did not commit sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. 
When he was insulted, he did not insult in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you are like sheep going astray, but you have now returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. My friends, a faithful perspective for Job's adversity is the same faithful perspective that we take for Paul and for Joseph and for Jesus. And it should be the same faithful perspective we take for us, for you, for me, for everyone else that's around us. It's simply this. We live in a fallen, broken world where tragic and terrible things happen to all people. Good, bad, and everybody in between. And where God gets the glory for all of it. Next week, we're going to talk about those eight ways we can ensure that we always have a faithful perspective when the question of why comes. But I want to close with this today. You might be here today and you might be going through a very hard time in life. You might be facing some of these really hard why questions of your own right now. Or maybe you know someone who is. Maybe you have a a mother or a father or a brother or a sister, a cousin or an uncle, maybe somebody you work with or go to school with. I want to close today by reading from Psalm 103. And when I begin to read, I hope you'll just close your eyes and just let it wash over you. Because this morning before we leave this place, I want you to consider the goodness of God. And I want you to consider all of his love for you. I want you to know that he sent his perfect, sinless son to suffer and die for you. He cares about you. You're not alone in your suffering. He wants you to be saved. He wants to adopt you into his holy family. He's not mad at you or punishing you. He loves you. He gave his son on the cross to die for you. So let me give you this faithful perspective of God and how much he loves you as we close. If you want to just listen to this, it's Psalm 103. I'm just going to start in verse 8. It says, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love. He will not always accuse us or be angry forever. He has not dealt with us as our sins deserve or repaid us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his faithful love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgression from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Maybe you're here today and you've never given your life to the Lord. You've never repented of your sins. You've never confessed Jesus as your Lord and Savior. He has not dealt with you as your sins deserve or repaid you according to your iniquities. Instead, he sent Jesus to die. He has offered to forgive your sins as far as the east is from the west to remove your transgressions from you if you will just repent, believe, and confess. If you have never called on the Lord, we're going to give you an opportunity to do that. Not by raising a hand or standing up, but simply by praying with me right now. Just say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed things up and gone astray. So I ask now by faith that you would change me. I ask by faith that you would forgive me. I ask by faith that you would make me new. Lord, I thank you for your grace and your goodness, for your love, for your mercy, and for accepting me just as I am on this day. Father, as we close, I want to lift up those who just gave their lives to you. What a joyous and wonderful day it is for them and for all of heaven as they rejoice. And Lord, I want to lift up those who are suffering, those who are hurting. 
Those who have questions of why that roll around in their heads and in their hearts day after day and sometimes hour after hour and minute after minute. Lord, those who are struggling, those who are facing adversity and they don't know why and they can't figure it out. Lord, I want to bring us back to where we first began. You are here. You are here. And Lord, I pray if they leave this place and they remember nothing else, that they will remember that you are here with them through whatever it is they're going through, that you love them, and that you have a plan, and that one way or another, you're going to get the glory. Lord, we thank you for being here. We thank you for being with us, and I pray you would meet the needs of your people. In Jesus' name we pray.